Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear a story from Mary Louise Defender Wilson. But first up, we have Kevin Kramer, the chairman of the North Dakota Public Service Commission. Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity. Always a pleasure. Well, as we get started, we'd like to tell the folks out there, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, where you're from. Sure. Well, I grew up in Kindred, North Dakota, in Cass County, a little Norwegian village, as I recall. It's been a bit more diversified since then. Um, but I was the oldest of five children. My mom and dad both still live in Kindred. My dad was is now retired, but uh, was a rural electric lineman for Cass County Electric. So I grew up a little bit in the utility business, understanding it from a lineman's perspective, of course. And uh, I was uh, the first of five children. Went to Concordia College, where I uh, have a Bachelor of Arts degree. Uh, I majored in social work, which there are a lot of social work professors scratching their heads these days, but I did major in social work and pre-seminary studies. Uh, from there went into, actually went into politics, working for Mark Andrews and his re-election bid in 1986. I worked for him in, in 85 and then went to work for the Republican Party after that. Uh, you know, was uh, worked my way up sort of in party politics, became the chairman of the North Dakota Republican Party at a time when our party was kind of at a slow ebb, frankly. We had, uh, I think, two public service commissioners and a state auditor were the only elected officials, state elected officials that were Republican at the time. We had one of the two legislative chambers, um, but by and large, we were at sort of the bottom of our game, and I happened to be chairman at the time when Ed Schaefer and Rosemary Myrdal were elected governor and lieutenant governor. Al Jager was elected secretary of state that year. That was in 1992, and uh, sort of the rest was history. I went to work in the Schaefer administration, spent four years as the state tourism director, still the most fun I've ever had at work, and then spent four years as the director of economic development and finance, which I think is a position that prepared me pretty well for what I'm doing today. When John Hoven became governor and there was a change in administration, I went to work for the University of Mary and helped start the Harold Schaefer Leadership Center and became the first director of the Harold Schaefer Leadership Foundation. Spent three years doing that and when the opportunity to come back into public life presented itself in the vacancy uh, of the Public Service Commission. I sought and received uh, uh, that support from Governor Hoven, was appointed for a year, ran for election in 2004, and, and now recently ran for re-election. Uh, in between that, I did go on to get my master's degree in business. And so while I, I have a social work degree on one hand and a business degree on the other hand, uh, the business degree from the University of Mary, uh, both have served me very well in my current capacity. Okay. Well, then, uh, what does, let's start off with the definition, what does a public uh, service commissioner do in North Dakota? Well, he does a lot these days. Uh, you know, it's sort of cyclical, but we have very broad authority as a commission, much more so than probably any uh, regulatory body or utility regulators in the country. We, first of all, have the traditional utility regulatory oversight of the investor-owned utilities, where we set rates for gas and electric uh, in investor-owned utilities. So if you're a customer of Ottertail Power or XL Energy or Montana Dakota Utilities, uh, we set those electric and gas rates uh, for those companies. And, and it's an area that I'm you know, interested in and use a lot of sort of economics background in. Um, but it's also kind of pales in some respects in comparison to many of the other things we do. We have very l broad oversight, uh, regulatory oversight of siting energy conversion facilities. That is to say, power plants, uh, wind farms, um, even things like gas processing facilities, which frankly we have two right now, open dockets on, on gas processing facilities in western North Dakota, and refineries that refine 50,000 barrels or more per day of uh, hydrocarbon liquids. So we've been doing a lot of siting. We also have uh, siting oversight of transmission lines, both electric as well as oil transmission lines, which of course includes pipelines, as well as CO2 lines and, and other types of, uh, mm -hmm. of liquid products. Well, and we're going to try to get into more sure. detail with those a little bit later <laughs> on, but uh, as you serve as chairman, uh, well, maybe describe the makeup of how, sure. how the commission Well, is. we're a three-member commission, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty traditional, although some states have five and some have as many as seven. We're an elected commission, which is a little bit unusual, but even more unusual, we're uh, all three elected on the statewide ballot and on the partisan ballot. So every two years, one of the seats being occupied by a commissioner comes up for election. And I, I state that very carefully because some people tend to refer to seats as theirs. These are not our seats, but rather we occupy them. So every two years, a public service commissioner comes up for re-election or a seat comes up for re-election. And, uh, 
and we have a statewide election. So the three of us, you know, anytime there are two of us, of course, there's a quorum. We're a very transparent, and very open commission, and all of the decisions by the commission, including hiring decisions, are done in, with a quorum of the commissioners. Okay, and of course, you recently won uh, re-election over uh, Brad Crabtree. But sort of, what is your approach to the job? Balance. If I was to put it in a word, it's balance, and it's it's an important uh, approach because we are not only a state that enjoys incredibly low utility rates. Uh, we're among the lowest in the country, in both electric and natural gas rates. Of course, we produce both, which is not insignificant either. So we want to make sure that that, that, that charge of, of uh, rates, for example, both ensures that the ratepayers are getting what they deserve for what they're paying and that they're not paying too much, and that at the same time that the companies that are investing in the infrastructure are investing and have enough to make sure that that infrastructure is adequate, that it's, that it's reliable, and that we have low-cost, reliable electricity and natural gas. At the same time, we're a major exporter, obviously. We both produce electricity and export it. We produce and export natural gas, as well as other, obviously, important energy resources. So that balance is really critical to ensuring that the economy of the state is strong, while at the same time that rates and prices remain appropriately low. Well, with that, uh, recently I understand you dealt with uh, some rates involving Montana, uh, Dakota utilities. Correct. Can, can you give us some? I can't give you much because okay. it's still an open docket. Okay. And when, when there's an open docket, especially on a, a rate case, it's a contested case, um, then we stand as judge and jury and of course we can't tip our hand. It, it was an interesting case. We've had the hearings. We had four days, four full days of very uh, combative, in some cases, hearings on the matter. What's at stake in that case and in all cases is, is the company entitled to a return uh, on certain investments? Were those investments prudent? Uh, are they used and useful? Do they serve to, uh, you know, to ensure the reliability of the system? And, and, and are the rates that are associated with the recovery of costs appropriate? So those are the sort of the basic issues, but what was sort of at interesting about this case and I think we will see in future cases is you're seeing a lot of investment now by the utilities understandably in new infrastructure all of this generation we read about wind farms and power plants and transmission lines have to be paid for by somebody and so while we've enjoyed as a as a state the growing economy that comes with energy development now as rate payers we it's time to sort of pay for some of that the stuff that's not exported. So that's sort of what's at stake, and I think, you know, I kind of have to leave it at that for now because it's we've not yet even seen the briefs, much less made the decision. Okay. With that, though, for some of our viewers out there, what areas uh, does Montana Dakota Utilities oh. uh, serve in North Dakota? Well, Montana Dakota Utilities serves uh, Bismarck. They're both electric and a gas utility. Um, they serve Bismarck and Minot and much of the central and western North Dakota, several other communities, Williston, Dickinson, a uh, no number of smaller communities as well. And in, I think in all of them they have uh, the natural gas and some they have electricity. I shouldn't say that in all of them. Some they have gas, some they have electricity, and in many cases they have both. Mm -hmm. um, so, but Montana Dakota is one of those companies that's interesting because they, they, their parent company, MDU Resources, which is headquartered in Bismarck, is the only Fortune 500 company in North Dakota. So we enjoy, in many respects, the, the value of this huge corporate citizen in North Dakota. And sometimes it gets a little confusing for the ratepayer. Um, but we do our very best to ensure that there is a ring fence around the utility that is not impacted or have a negative impact on the parent company. And it's a, it's a huge part of what we do. Okay. Well, now, does the commission have uh, ju jurisdiction about what's going on over in the oil fields out in the western part of North Dakota? And if so, what sure. is it? We have a lot, actually. I always say it's good to be us. You know, it's a funny thing. We have, we have regulatory oversight over 100,000 acres of coal mines and then the power plants that that coal feeds, 30 million tons per year that's mined in North Dakota. We have jurisdiction over the transmission lines that carry the electricity to the oil fields that, that powers those, uh, those important facilities in the oil fields, that pumps the oil out of the ground, that puts it in the pipelines that we have siting authority of, that takes it to the refinery that we site, that then turns it into to diesel and gasoline, which goes into the trucks that haul the coal. It's good to be us. We are part of that entire circle. The Public Service Commission does not have jurisdiction over the exploration and recovery of oil. 
but we have do have jurisdiction over the siting of the pipelines which are immense and growing and critical to the infrastructural needs of moving that product into the marketplace so we have that important jurisdiction uh, as well as the gas lines we also have gas pipeline safety jurisdiction which in, you know kind of gets involved in some of that and doesn't in other parts of it it all depends on federal jurisdictions things like that and then of course in the energy conversion piece um, we do have siting of gas for example processing facilities that process a million or a hundred million cubic feet or more per day currently we have two of those uh, Hess up in Tioga is building a 250,000 uh, cubic feet per day or 250 million cubic feet per day gas processing facility and Bear Paw Energy which is a subsidiary of One Oak out of Tulsa Oklahoma is building a 100 million cubic feet per day gas processing facility around Watford City. Those are two facilities that we have direct jurisdiction over. So yeah, we're very involved to say the least in, in what's happening in the oil and oil play in North Dakota. Okay. Well, I understand recently, I don't, I don't know how long ago it was, you met uh, with some Grand Forks officials about wind turbines. Sure. Can you d tell us about what's going well, on Well, I can. You know, wind is, is huge. It's interesting. We, before the first wind turbine was built in North Dakota, uh, we were the sixth leading exporter of electricity. We generate about 4,500 megawatts of electricity from uh, burning coal here in, in North Dakota. At the same time, in the last uh, seven years, just since I've been on the commission, North Dakota has gone from 50th in wind generation capacity to now number 10. And I would suspect by the end of this year, uh, early part of 2011, uh, North Dakota will probably be eighth or ninth in terms of its nameplate capacity of wind energy installed. We will have over 1,500 megawatts of wind capacity installed in North Dakota and several hundred if not thousands more in, in the queue. In fact, right now at the Public Service Commission, we have about 5,000 megawatts of wind capacity that is in our queue, in our docket, that has not yet been built. But it's at some level of regulatory oversight, letters of intent, applications, hearings are scheduled. So there's a lot going on in the wind area. Our meeting with Grand Forks officials was somewhat unique because what was at issue there is some concern that was raised by the Air Force Base relating to how wind turbines affect radar and the false signals that that may send for the UAVs that, that uh, fly uh, out of the Grand Forks Air Force Base. And we want to make sure that all of that's that, that's harmonious, that, that the energy needs of the country and the, the opportunities for North Dakotans don't conflict with the national security of our nation. So uh, it gets pretty complex at times, but it's a great blessing to be part of it. Well, a little bit here, uh, you know, you talked about the thoughts of wind energy. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts of wind energy sure. in North Dakota? And, and maybe update a little bit. I mean, you know, as you drive around the state, you're mm -hmm. seeing more and more uh, wind turbines up, especially in the northwestern part yes. of the state. Well, it's funny you ask that because it's an evolution like a lot of things. Um, public opinion is, is, if not shifting, at least uh, taking a good hard uh, look, perhaps. Wind energy is one of those things that's always more romantic before it happens <laughs> than after you're looking at it. And for some people, it's still romantic. They see those big wind turbines and they think that's wonderful. It's generating electricity, clean and green, of course. It's also creating economic opportunity for landowners that have turbines on their land and for the companies that hire people and their employees. At the same time, it has a very different environmental footprint because it's so huge, uh, different than, say, a coal plant. So with 1500 megawatts installed it's no longer a romantic notion it's now a reality and people are having the opportunity to see turbines up close to see large wind farms on the horizon and it's causing them to at least think about uh, how far into the future do we want to go with this development I think that, that we're going to go a long ways but you're also seeing technological changes you know the early wind farms that I was part of siting five six years ago had turbines that were one to one and a half megawatts we have a docket right now where we'll be having a hearing here shortly that will be placing three megawatt turbines and when you start seeing the larger turbines and different technologies and they're more efficient and more productive it starts making more economic sense and that's why some people who and will continue to be critical of the investment that the government has made through tax credits and whatnot may at some point see that that investment pay off because whenever you invest, and it's not unusual for the government to invest, in sort of early stages of development of technology, eventually perhaps that technology catches up and then starts making economic sense. So, you know, I, I, I remain still bullish, I guess, on wind energy. 
as a resource, as long as we don't expect to depend on it completely for baseload uh, energy development, it just can't do that. There's just no way that it, it can do that. But we're an energy development state. We, I think we do it pretty well. Okay. With that said, the commission is also involved in a lot of areas that the public may not even be aware of. Sure. And maybe if, if you've mentioned a lot of them, mm -hmm. but now let's go through them each and, and talk a little bit about what it entails. And uh, let's start with uh, abandoned mine lands. Sure. Well, prior to siting uh, or prior to permitting coal mine, prior to the reclamation laws of the 70s, there were, you know, in the early part of, even of this, um, s the last century, there was a lot of underground coal mining going on around the world, around the country, including North Dakota. There are a lot of abandoned underground mines uh, scattered throughout western North Dakota that have since long ago been abandoned. Well, they provide a, present a tremendous hazard, as you might imagine. Some of them are under roads, some of them are in pastures, some of them are in communities like Beulah, and um, there are cave-ins from time to time. And so there's a federal program called Abandoned Mine Lands that the North Dakota Public Service Commission administers, 100% funded by, through the federal government by, however, I might add, by taxes paid by existing current active coal companies. We oversee that program. We restore and reclaim those abandoned mine lands at a priority level based on the most serious and the presenting the greatest hazard uh, to the least. We've been doing it for the last several years and plan to do it for decades as long as the money's available to do that. So it's an important part of what we do. You're right, very few people know about it, but if we didn't do it well, they'd find out about it because their house might cave in. And from time to time, we hear stories like that. More commonly, tractors fall into these big holes that they didn't know existed under the ground. Okay, so what about coal mines then? Well, we have, as I said earlier, about, well, actually over 100,000 acres of permitted uh, coal mines right now in North Dakota. We mine about 30 million tons per year. The vast majority of that coal goes into mine mouth operations right here in, n near the mines that generate electricity. Some, however, in the case of some uh, of the uh, the stuff that comes out of the Coteau mine goes to the Dakota gasification facility that Basin Electric owns that turns uh, coal into synthetic natural gas and the CO2 that is extracted from that is piped to Weyburn, Saskatchewan for tertiary oil recovery. Um, so yeah, we oversee everything from the pre-data collection prior to the permitting of the mine, we permit the mine, all the way until the final bond is released some 50, 60 years later in many cases. And so we really, our main charge is to oversee the reclamation of those mined lands. And that is a standard that's very high. We ensure that, that uh, any mined land is restored to its productivity level equal to or greater than previous to mining. We, nobody does it better, frankly, than we do it right here in North Dakota. And that's a testament as much to the coal mining companies themselves as it is to, to uh, certainly the, to the Public Service Commission. Okay. Well, you, you've talked a lot, but we, let's hit on it again. Electric and gas utilities, yeah. uh, your oversight. Uh, Just relying, making sure that people are, are charged appropriate rates, but that those rates are enough that provide a return on the equity and the investment of the utilities to ensure a reliable system. Again, I think we do it very well. We have the lowest electricity rates in the country. We didn't always have that. Uh, the hydro states have done very, very well uh, generally in producing low-cost electricity, but, but because of our vast wind resources and our vast coal resources, they're both pretty low cost, at least the coal is low cost, the wind is free, um, the development not so much, but because there's so much electricity generated, our supply is very high up here in, uh, in the Great Plains, and so North Dakota enjoys the, the fruits of that. Well, again, but how much control do you actually have in, in establishing the rates for the 100%. Utilities? 100%. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, we, we set the rates. Uh, of course, the utilities request them. The utilities, the burden of proof is on a utility in any rate case to prove that the rates are just and, and reasonable and that they're used and useful, uh, the, the, the facilities that are um, covered in the rates. And it is through a hearing process uh, where the preponderance of the evidence is the standard. And... Uh, and we can only consider evidence that is in the record, and we hear hours and hours and hours after reading thousands of pages of pre-filed testimony to prove the, uh, the value of, of uh, the rates being requested and the rates that we ultimately decide on. I don't know that any company's ever requested, gotten from us what they've requested. I don't know that they've ever gotten half of what they've requested. So it's a rigorous process to ensure that, that people are getting what they're paying for. Okay. And how about telecommunication uh, companies? And could you sort of define that for us? Too? Well, telecommunications companies in, in a, uh, simply are phone companies. Mm -hmm. Of course, that used to mean Ma Bell. Exactly. <laughs> and with the breakup of Ma Bell and the, the sort of the 
deregulation, if you will, and the shift of regulatory oversight from states to the FCC, the role of public service commissions and state commissions has been greatly diminished. But what we basically see now is we oversee the insurance that, that competitors, whether they're cell phone companies or, or competitive bundling companies or, or non-facilities-based uh, companies, we know we have hundreds of them in North Dakota, that, that their relationship with the incumbent is one that ensures that, that that infrastructure that was invested a long time ago is available to the competitors, that it's not redundant, and that there isn't uh, a need for more redundant or re, you know, repetitive infrastructure, and that it is that it is bought into, if you will, and rented at a, a rate that is appropriate. And it ensures both the security of the incumbent, but also the opportunity for competitors. Okay. And how about the railroads out there? Well, it's funny because every, you know the Utilities Commission started out as a railroad commission. That's how we were started. But because of the Staggers Act, of course, that is another area where at least rate regulation, the traditional economic regulation, was shifted to the federal government, and the Federal Surface Transportation Board now oversees the rates of railroads, and at least Class One railroads. But the commission has, by law, the jurisdiction of representing shippers' interests with the federal government in any rate case. So our main role is to ensure that the grain companies, the shippers, the marketers of North Dakota's ag products uh, are protected from... Uh, from the unfair monopoly pricing, if you will, and then we take a case, if necessary, to the federal government. Hmm. And then what about auctions and auctioneering? <laughs> well, we license auctioneers. We ensure that an auctioneer is an auctioneer in good standing, that he can talk fast, uh, but more importantly, that he's appropriately bonded and that the clerk that handles the money is appropriately bonded so that people are protected from any unscrupulous types of, uh, of auctions and auctioneers. It's an area, frankly, that I think is probably questionable in terms of its need. Uh, I think some of the, a lot of times licensing is meant or was designed to as a barrier to entry for competition and that might be one of those areas. But at any rate, to this date we have that jurisdiction. And what about uh, weights and measures? Well, we ensure that a pound is a pound mm -hmm. at the grocery store and that a gallon is a gallon at the gas station. And mainly it's to ensure that, again, in, that consumers are protected and that there is a traceability, if you will, of, of measurement standards into the international marketplace. If you're selling a product internationally, the pr people at the other end want to make sure that that standard is traceable, that they're getting a pound, that they're getting a ton, that they're getting a bushel, whatever it is that they're paying for, that that's what they're getting. They need to have that assurance. So we have, a, we have inspectors that go out and make sure that, that a pound is a pound and that a gallon is a gallon in, in, simple, in sort of the simple explanation. And then uh, grain elevators? We license that? grain elevators as well and ensure that, that our producers and anybody that would sell to a grain elevator is as protected as they can be. So uh, part of that licensing is making sure that, that the capacity of that elevator is appropriately bonded. We also then oversee the, what's called the indemnity fund, which ensures that, that that's a fund that, is, that we actually control that is paid into by, uh, by producers and that that anybody that ha that doesn't sell grain on cash, that is to say that they, they would sell it on in what's called a credit sale contract, terms of greater than, say, 45 days, has an insurance policy should there become an insolvency of that elevator. So basically, we're just ensuring that producers are, are as protected as they can be. If people want more information, where can they go? Well, the best thing they should do is just go to nd.gov and, and look under the Public Service Commission's website. There's a ton of information, probably more than most people can, can deal with. But I always say, if we, do, we think we do our jobs pretty well, and if most people don't know what we do, but if we did it poorly, they'd know. <laughs> Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. My today. pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Stay tuned for more. Storyteller Mary Louise Defender Wilson of Shields, North Dakota, is a renowned story and tale teller, and in this piece, she tells the story of the deer. In the beginning, they said when fawns were born, they were all one color, and they also smelled like deer. And on this particular day, while Doe was looking at her fawn, and she was feeling so sad, she said, she said, you poor thing, you may never grow up. 
And when I thought they were here, here all of a sudden the wind blew, and the deer thought, this is a very different wind. I wonder what, what it means. But she goes standing there looking at her fawn, and all of a sudden the wind spoke to her and said, I know that you're feeling bad about your child, so I'm going to help you. Dig some prairie turnips, these grow all over, and peel them. And take that and sprinkle it on your child's back. So the doe did that. And the wind came and blew, and the white spots then were imprinted on the fawn's back. And then the wind also told her, and I will take away that smell of the deer until it grows up and is able to run. So that is then how the deer are able to live. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.